Hey, welcome back. Today we're talking about simple harmonic motion, what's the equation for position with it, how to use that equation, and what does it all mean. So let's go ahead and get to it. And so let's remind ourselves of what we actually mean by simple harmonic motion. So we're talking about any repeating motion where the object is oscillating back and forth and the amount of displacement from the equilibrium position is proportional to the restoring force that's going to cause it to go back to equilibrium. So for instance, this mass on a spring, the more it's moved to the right, the more the force is going to be back to the left, and vice versa. The more it's compressed to the left, the more the restoring force is going to be going to the right. And if it is proportional, then we're talking about simple harmonic motion. Now, what we can do with simple harmonic motion too, visually, and this is to help us to understand what we're going to be talking about, is we can think about simple harmonic motion and its relationship with circular motion because there's a really, really interesting and fundamental relationship here. A lot of what we've talked about with circular motion in terms of our variables, concepts, and even units with radians can be applied to simple harmonic motion. The x value that we're going to see right here for something that's moving in a circular path, it's going to follow the same pattern as simple harmonic motion. In a way, it is kind of like simple harmonic motion in its own sense. And so a lot of the concepts that we've used in the past already can be applied here. And so let's go ahead and start thinking about how would we write an equation? How would we derive or come up with an equation for position for an object that's moving in simple harmonic motion? So the mass on the end of a spring, for instance, what position would it have at some point in time, basically, is what we're talking about. So first of all, what I could do is show you a point in the animation in the lower right that's going to correspond to the image in the lower left. And we could start thinking about just simple trig ideas where we want to think about our position and its relationship with the radius and its relationship with the angle that's involved here. So you could say, well, let's just go ahead and use cosine and think about what that would be in terms of x and r. And you would say, well, let's just isolate for x. If we do that, we end up with x is equal to r cosine theta. All I'm doing is working with the simple trig function here because we want to drive some equation where we can figure out what the position of an object in simple harmonic motion is going to be at any given time. Now if you look at this, there's no time in here, so we want to start to work in our time into our equation. And there's one other thing that we haven't used yet, and that's this idea in the lower right, this idea that we can relate simple harmonic motion to circular motion. This theta business right here, that can be changed out, so let's think about why we can do this. So remember, if you have a definition for angular velocity right here, you could say that's going to be delta theta over delta time. This is the rotational version of just saying like V average is equal to delta x over delta time. And if you don't have that memorized, you can justify that easily from your rotational kinematics equations on your equation sheet. So then we could say, well, let's imagine that our initial time and our omega initial are both equal to zero. And that's the case for most cases when you're dealing with time. So if that's what we were dealing with, we could say theta is equal to omega times time. We could take that and we could say, all right, let's go ahead and sub in omega times time for that theta value, for that angle. And now we've achieved something important. We have changed this equation so that it has a time variable inside there, which is what we want. We want to know the position of an object in simple harmonic motion with respect to time. And that's what we're doing here. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to say, well, what about this R value? Because we can do something with that R value. The R value, if you think about it, that's going to be our maximum displacements that the object can go. Like when this object moves back and forth, you could say what's happening is the maximum displacement that it could have would be like the R value. So let's change out that R value to make it more general and say, well, that's going to represent our maximum displacement from equilibrium. So we're going to write that. That will write as x max. A lot of equations write this as a capital A to represent amplitude. And if you've already learned about amplitude, that's effectively what we're talking about here, or the maximum possible displacement from equilibrium. So we've got this and this. We've already talked about where these things come from. Let's talk about phi over here, this Greek letter. This is an offset. This is a phase constant that we have to take into account because there's something true about trig, and I'm going to show you in just a sec what I'm talking about, but there's something true where if you think about a sine function and a cosine function, 
They're basically the same, but they are offset by 90 degrees or 1 half pi radians. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. If you take a look, this red equation right here is the sine function. The blue equation is the cosine function. They have the same shapes of functions. They're just offset. They're slid over by a certain amount. And we need to keep that in mind. We need to be able to modify our equation by a phase constant or a phase shift. And that's what this variable over here allows us to do. This equation is on your equation sheet for AP Physics C Mechanics students. I do want to point out a couple things. So our current position as the object oscillates at some value of time is going to be this x value. This x max is like our amplitude, the cosine. Now over here, we've got omega. In this context, we're going to call this angular frequency, not angular velocity. It's going to be angular frequency. All right, so let me talk you through what's going on here. There is actually a lot going on. As we begin this animation, you've got this red value. That means there's a lot of potential energy. I'm looking at the pie chart right now, as well as the other graph. So at this point in the animation, there's a lot of stretching that's happened with the spring. And that energy is going to be released as I cause the animation to go forward a bit. So we're going to take a look at that. If you see that, what's happening is that energy is going to be converted into kinetic and then back into potential right now. So we've basically got the energy back in potential. This animation I've got from O Physics, which is a fantastic physics website. I'll put a link to that in the description below. I highly recommend people go check this out. You can play with this yourself and see as you modify things how results change. One other thing I want you to start noticing is that we've got some graphs in the upper right. So we've got a position time graph, a velocity time graph, acceleration time graph, potential energy time graph, and a kinetic energy time graph. So if we continue to play the animation here, what you're going to see is the position is going to go back and forth and oscillate like a cosine wave. And as it oscillates, what happens is its velocity and acceleration are going to change as well. So you should take a look at the velocity and the acceleration. That's going to be the topic for the next screencast in the series as I wrap this one up. But I do want you to start thinking about what would be true about the velocity and the acceleration for this. So hopefully that's been helpful. If you have any comments down below, please let me know. And I'm going to put a link to the next screencast when I get a chance in the upper right. Take care.